Tonight on Nation to Nation, we look entirely at child welfare, particularly Bill C-92, which many are calling a victory. Specifically, it gives the power to make sure that First Nations can write their own laws. It does so by affirming inherent rights and by pushing provinces out of the way. And the federal government um, just concedes that um, Indigenous groups do have the right uh, to exercise jurisdiction in the area of child and family services. The bill's getting a lot of support, but it still needs work before becoming law. What I see as a major shortcoming is there's no money to implement or these First Nations, Métis and Inuit models of jurisdiction attached to this bill. I'm Todd Lamoran and welcome to Nation to Nation. A week ago, the federal government finally tabled the legislation on child welfare reform, Bill C-92. It didn't get much attention because of the continuing SNC-Lavalin scandal. But here at Nation & Nation, we're going to give it that attention. First, let's go back to last week's press conference. That's when former Indigenous Services Minister Jane Philpott said this. And we've done some really, really important things that I'm tremendously proud of as a government. But I don't think there's anything as important as this. This bill is going to change people's lives. It's not going to do everything, and there's going to be a heck of a lot of hard work ahead. But this is going to change people's lives. Cindy Blackstock is the executive director of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society. She has been a longtime advocate on behalf of children in care, and she joins me now to discuss Bill C-92. Welcome, Ms. Blackstock, to Nation to Nation. Hey, thanks, and thanks for giving attention to this really important and vital matter. Uh, as you've just seen from that clip, uh, the former Indigenous Services Minister said a week ago, uh, it will not only change lives, but will C-92 keep families together and even save lives? It depends, uh, is the answer to that. And, you know, I want to make really clear, it's not my job to kind of support or not support the bill. My job is to kind of get as much information out there so that we can do the best job for First Nations, Métis and Inuit kids. And what I see as a major shortcoming is there's no money to implement or these First Nations, Métis and Inuit models of jurisdiction attached to this bill. And I can just say from, you know, having spent 12 years litigating against Canada to try and get equitable funding for First Nations child welfare, that we can't rely just simply on goodwill from government, uh, regardless of what party's in, in play. So I think that's a place where it needs to definitely be strengthened. And uh, the other piece is around ensuring that the, so the self-determination pieces are really there and are, cannot be kind of overcome by different types of legal technicalities. Uh, you uh, said a week ago that C-92, as you were just mentioning, fails to create statutory funding. We're talking about statutory funding. What are we talking about? We're talking about it actually being a positive duty on the government to pay. So what that means is that they have to pay uh, according to some kind of funding principles. And we'd like to use the principles that have worked well for Jordan's principle and what the tribunal has found. So that means that it's based on the needs of the children. And as you know, Todd, traveling from community to community, those needs can be quite different. But we want the people on the ground in the community to determine what those needs are. The second thing is that we recognize that funding needs to increase over time. So I don't want to see words like stable or predictable because what we found with child welfare is actually take some money, big money out the front end to get uh, children up to the same place as other children are in order to make up for that multi-generational trauma. So that's something called substantive equality. We'd like to see that in. And then the other thing is culturally based. You know, child welfare is just a Western concept that was kind of put on many First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities. Traditionally, of the laws I've seen, they're really more like child and family well-being and community well-being laws that would take into account things like education, health care, housing, and that's the other piece of the funding envelope. We need to get at those pieces too and address those inequalities. And I haven't seen any real positive steps by the federal government to eliminate all inequalities First Nations kids face which means we might end up with a bill that gives First Nations jurisdiction, but not the resources to implement it. So how do we get this continuous funding model that you're advocating for? Is it just through uh, successive federal budgets, or is there has to be something 
even different? Well, if it was in legislation, it would provide a uh, kind of a mandatory benchmark, if you like, that the federal government has to fund. So it's not subject to kind of, you know, different political views and priorities that we see come and go. That the children would actually have a floor to stand on financially, and, and communities would know there was some predictability that they're getting this amount of money over, you know, like 10 years, 20 years. And that's the type of time frame that you'd like to see in good community plans for kids. Uh, you, of course, talked about your concerns over funding, but is there anything positive that you see in this uh, legislation? I like the recognition of cultural continuity um, as a principle. I'd like to see that actually being given the same amount of uh, paramountcy or the same weight as best interests of the child, because to me, all that stuff's interconnected, right? Uh, the recognition of substantive equality is good, but how to enforce that is still a live question in terms of how to enforce it either on the provinces or on the federal government. Um, so there's good content in there, um, but it depends on how it's interpreted and it depends if it's funded. Uh, of course, uh, there is this idea that uh, jurisdiction will finally be handed over to First Nations, to Indigenous groups, I should say. Uh, do you see that as being a key po part of uh, C92? I think it's got the potential to do that. Um, I think we need to see from a, a variety of different kind of legal experts whether it actually achieves that. And uh, certainly that's something that I've got my mind open to and that we've uh, talked to some lawyers on some preliminary advice, but I'd like to see a wide array of people because honestly, this is breaking new ground, right? We've never seen anything like this, or at least I haven't. So I think we need to be really clear that on a couple of points. One is First Nations kids deserve the best. I think the time for mediocre or the best we could do, that's got to be in the past, right? Like, I mean, if we don't give this generation of kids the best we can under what is considered to be a reconciliation government, then what are we leaving for future generations? I want the best, right? That's what we should be aiming for. If they don't give it to, a, to the kids, well, then that's theirs to bear to weight. But uh, for us as First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, it should be top drawer type of treatment for our kids. Second is, we need to make sure that this isn't just words on paper, that it actually can be translated into making a difference in children's lives. Because so many of our families and so many of our kids and youth have had a lot of promises and no delivery. And I think the time for that is over too. So uh, we need to see kind of uh, some real changes in this bill to make it, take it from kind of a mediocre bill to something that really honors this generation of children. Do you see those changes happening after the legislation gets passed or it has to be done uh, in committee? I think it has to be done now. I think it has to be done in committee. And, uh, you know, like I think why not, right? Why can't we do better is my always question, right? Um, they do all kinds of things government does. They concluded a trade deal with Trump. If they can do that, they can make sure that this bill is modified in such a way that it brings real honor to this generation of children and all the generations to follow. All it takes is some political focus and some political will. Uh, Ms. Blackstock, it's always a pleasure to have you on Nation to Nation. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you. After the break, we have an interview with the Director General from Indigenous Services who oversaw this reform. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Last year, the federal government held an emergency meeting on child welfare. It was to hear from stakeholders and begin discussions on ways to keep Indigenous kids at home. Soon after that meeting, our next guest was brought in to oversee reform on child and family services and programs for Indigenous children. Issa Gros-Louis is the Director General of the Department's Child Family Services Reform Branch and is here to help us get down to the brass tacks of this legislation. Ms. Gros-Louis, welcome to Nation to Nation. Thank you. Uh, first off, tell me a bit more about your role in CFS reform in the drafting of this bill. Certainly. Uh, so as you have just mentioned, um, in January 2018, there was an emergency meeting at which um, uh, Minister Phil Pott, then the Minister of Indigenous Services Canada, um, declared that um, the situation of Indigenous children in uh, the uh, Child and Family Services was um, uh, a situation of crisis. And so she uh, outlined the six points of action to reform child and family services. And one of the point of action was to co-develop with partners options for a potential federal legislation. 
So based on, on that point of action, we uh, proceeded to engage across the country uh, with our partners, uh, indigenous partners, as well as provincial and federal uh, partners. We held over 65 uh, engagement sessions over the summer and the fall. And um, at the end of this, we uh, created a reference group uh, because during the engagement, we uh, consulted with approximately 2,000 people who had very uh, interesting and good ideas, but we had to um, uh, narrow it down to viable options. So we created a reference group uh, that included representatives from each national indigenous organization. They had two representatives each, and uh, their task was to look at what was heard during uh, those engagement sessions and to come up with viable options for a federal uh, legislation and that's what they did. They recommended a federal legislation that would affirm the inherent right of indigenous people and would uh, create standards uh, for the best interests of the child. And following that, uh, the government then um, used that uh, for the basis of the development of their policy and to inform the development of the bill that we have here before us. Now, this bill we have before us, of course, needs royal assent uh, pretty soon. Um, but how will it change the way non-Indigenous CFS agencies care for Indigenous children, especially off-reserve? Correct. So. Um when the legislation will fully come into uh, force, every um, agency and everybody will have to respect certain minimum standards for the best interests of the child. And that uh, means that uh, provincial uh, agencies will also have to respect those minimal uh, standards and they will have to be applied to all indigenous children um, being encountered in the system. But those minimal standards will also be uh, applied by the indigenous groups who will develop their legislation, who will also have to apply those minimum standards. Uh, it also affirms indigenous jurisdiction over child welfare, but how will that bill, this bill allow, say, First Nations to actually assert that jurisdiction? So there, there are a few steps um, that are envisioned in the bill for indigenous group to assert jurisdiction. One option is for the indigenous group to give notice that they have created a law, law, a law and, and that would end there. But that would mean that their law would not have federal status and their law would not uh, be taking precedent over federal or provincial law over uh, child and family services. So the second option is for an indigenous group who has a law to require or to make a request um, of the federal government and provincial or territorial government in which they reside uh, to have a discussion about a coordination agreement. And during those discussions, they would have 12 months to either come to an agreement or if at the 12 month period they do not come to an agreement, their law nevertheless would come into force and would have precedence over federal and provincial um, child and family services laws. Um, but that doesn't prevent uh, the parties from continuing to have conversation to make sure that they have a good enforcement mechanism through a coordinated agreement. And also another uh, point is that uh, throughout those discussions, there is, uh, they will have access to alternative dispute mechanisms. So during their discussions, should they be um, an, an issue on which they cannot all agree upon, they can make use of that um, mechanism to resolve their issues. Um, what if the province just doesn't want to give up jurisdiction over this? Because of course, uh, the, through the constitution, they do have jurisdiction right now. Mm -hmm. So that would probably be determined by the courts. Uh, some say uh, how this is drafted currently is historic. Uh, how is that so? So it's historic in, in many ways, one of them being that um, this is one of the few instances where a federal legislation legislates on uh, behalf or, or for um, the three uh, distinction-based distinction um, indigenous groups. So it does cover the Inuit, the Métis, and the First Nations. The other legislation that does that is also the, uh, lang uh, the Language Act that recently was also introduced. And this uh, 
legislation was fully endorsed by uh, the three national leaders uh, when it was introduced. Um, and of course, um, the other point that makes it historic is that um, it affirms uh, the inherent right uh, to this area of uh, jurisdiction, whereas before, um, indigenous group would have to um, either demonstrate or, or argue in court that they had that jurisdiction. So in this case, uh, the federal government um, just concedes that um, indigenous group do have the right uh, to exercise jurisdiction in the area of child and family services. So I, I guess I'm assuming there you're not expecting any court, any court battles over this jurisdiction uh, unless a First Nation uh, uh, definitely doesn't want to opt into any of this? We don't anticipate um, any, any further issues. Um, we had consultation, when we did the consultation, we consulted with Indigenous partners, we consulted with the federal, uh, sorry, the uh, provincial and territorial governments. Um, we're hoping that uh, everybody sees that this is for um, the benefit of children and everybody agrees that the best interest of the child is something that we can all agree upon. Uh, that's certainly the case and I think most of the concerns have been about the, this bill has been around funding. Uh, in the legislation. If passed, how would funding be determined if uh a nation or a group does assert their jurisdiction? Mm -hmm. So there's a number of issues that are going to be determined in a second phase, uh, which is the uh, transition phase by a transition committee. And the issue of a proper funding, so proper venues for conversation, uh, the proper funding, proper funding mechanisms, a capacity building, all these issues will be addressed um, in the second phase by a transition committee. Uh, and can you tell us a little bit more about this transition committee, exactly what's its function? Um, so it still has to be co-developed, so in the spirit of co-development that we have used uh, from the beginning, including how we were going to engage with our partners, the co-development of the legislation, the implementation phase of this uh, legislation will also be in a spirit of co-development. Um, so the details of all of this transition committee needs to be discussed with our partners. Um, but like I said, issues for possible conversation and discussion would be um, funding, um, uh, capacity building. We heard also um, when we did uh, engagement uh, partners telling us that the possibility of an institution that may help as a, um, a center of expertise for data collection, for capacity building. Um, so those are all um, up for discussion with our partners. Okay, uh, Ms. Gros-Louis, I want to thank you for getting down to the details with us on this. Thank you. My pleasure. We'll have more after another short break. Welcome back. The three major Indigenous groups each support this bill. They were all on hand at last week's announcement in Ottawa, as was our next guest. Kevin Hart is the Assembly of First Nations Regional Chief for Manitoba. Chief Hart, welcome to Nation to Nation. Good morning. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you. Why does the AFN support this bill? Well, you know, this is uh, first of its kind uh, legislation that gives the power to the First Nations to uh, write their own laws when it comes to child and family as well as the well-being of our children and our families in the First Nation. It gives precedence over uh, tribal jurisdiction as well as uh, traditional knowledge and traditional law and such and how it's enacted. It helps the First Nation and the families keep the children within the first uh, family unit. And secondary would be the nation where, you know, the chief and the council would have a say on the member of their nation and for, to keep them within the family unit and within the nation unit. From there, of course, you know, keeping it within the nations themselves and then, of course, the region and that. But specifically, it gives the power to make sure that First Nations can write their own laws and they can uh, bring the province to the tables. As you know, that the province has jurisdiction when it comes to child and family services, especially First Nation children and all the provinces. I've been openly stating that, uh, you know, that the provinces uh, have refused to deal with First Nations because of the economic reasons and the political reasons as well, too, when it comes to child and family services in the specific regions for First Nation children. So how much work did it take to get to this point? 
you know, it took a lot of work with the legislative working group, you know, that we had to take into account uh, specific, unique purposes for, for each region, for example. BC has their own approach when it comes to child and family services. They're very unique with their modern day treaties and some of them don't even have treaties, so they're working that way, but it gives them the power to enact and write their own laws when it comes to child and family and, and, and the services and such and the protection mechanisms to give jurisdiction to them. And then also when we look at the other provinces, you have numbered uh, treaties that go across Alberta, Saskatchewan, as well as Manitoba, and that, you know, they have unique circumstances where they've signed their treaties to nation to nation with the government and then the Crown. And of course, when we look at the pre-Confederation treaties going uh, eastward as well, and we also have to take into account uh, north of 60 and what our relatives in the Yukon and the NWT face in that when it comes to this. So it, it was a very, uh, uh, how would you say, it? very su substantive process in taking everybody's uniqueness and their values as well as how they see this bill and legislation coming forward. So working with the legislative working group as well as our National Advisory Committee on Child uh, Welfare, we did that, but of course you know that there's other uh, uh, brothers and sisters from the, the Métis as well as the Inuit that ha are in this bill as well too, so you have to take all of that into account when, we, when this bill came forward. Uh, finally, Chief Hart, do you think this bill will go a long ways to saving lives? Well, you know what, the way I see it right now that uh, every child that's in uh, CFS care right now if we lose a child that's in CFS care, who's responsible for that? Is it, the res is it the responsibility of the federal government or the provincial government, right? Because for us to have jurisdiction, jurisdiction over our children, first and foremost, you know, we want to keep those children within our, our sacred circles, within the, the immediate family unit, going outside there to the family, your aunts, uncles, you know, your grandmas and your grandpas, and then outside that base you talk about the nation specifically that those children belong to. And that's what we talk about when we go forward as nation to nation, that we should have that right. We've always said that, that we have the jurisdiction and we can write our own laws. You know, when we talk about uh, treaties that were signed nation to nation, the day before the signing of treaty, us as First Nation people had our governance systems in place. We had our own laws in place that were based on traditional knowledge as well as knowledge that's been passed down since time immemorial. So, you know, after the day of treaty signing, we still had those governance systems in place and those same laws and such. However, because of time and space and history of this Canadian government and the provinces and the territories, you know, we have provincial law, we have federal law and legislation as well as uh, policies and that that were uh, done uh, unilaterally from the top-down approach that uh, made decisions on behalf of First Nations without our consultation or engagement as you know and that this gives the power back to the nations to write their own laws as rightfully so in our inherent rights and such moving forward so that we can take back the jurisdiction of our children is there a lot of work that needs to be done? Of course there is. So, you know, that's why I'm working with leadership as well as the experts across this country to make sure that this is a, a great uh, legislation for our people as well as to build it up to ensure that it's the best legislation moving forward as well. Uh, Chief Hart, I want to thank you for talking to me. We're out of time, but uh, thank you for speaking. Take care, Todd. Have a good day. That's our show for tonight, but if you missed any part of it or a past episode, you can check out our podcasts. Go to aptnnews.ca slash podcast. I'm Todd Lamarand. Thanks for watching.